Well, first off, I, I have to say, after the brief reference to the Yankees, that I'm a lifelong Cubs fan. <laughs> and, uh, nine years ago, I appeared on the ESPN special. I, I don't know if any of you saw it. Whose curse is worse, Red Sox and Cubs on trial? <laughs> Where the jury killed us. But they were, dead, as jury sometimes are, dead wrong. <laughs> you know, the Red Sox were never cursed, and the Cubs really were. Anyhow, um, I was thinking this morning, this has to be a curious way for many of you to start your day, or I should say start your work week. Uh, first off, with uh, an hour of discussion of you know, the teaching and interpretation of American history, I'm sure it carries many of you back to you know, some high school experience when you had 815 social studies class and were struggling to stay awake or whatever. So what I'd like to do is to try to make the subject as interesting as I can. I'm going to speak uh, for you know, about half an hour, and some may have to give me the hook if I, if I get in trouble uh, time-wise, uh, on an issue that I think troubles teachers at every level, uh, the question of how you talk about the Founding Fathers and slavery. Uh, during the three decades when I taught the first segment of the U.S. History uh, Survey at Stanford, going back to 1980, uh, I would always end the class with a lecture on Thomas Jefferson and the American Dilemma. Uh, ending the class in a way actually led me to write a bit on the subject in, in a volume done on Jefferson and, Sal and Sally Hemings uh, by University of Virginia Press. And so it's, it's, it's something I've thought a lot about and uh, always wanted to use my last lecture to raise moral as well as historical questions about how one thinks about the past. And I'll say something about that uh, as I go along uh, this morning. So let's start by setting up, an, an, the thing I suppose I should say is, um, I've written a lot about Jefferson, but as mentioned, I'm really much more of a Madisonian. Uh, I spend most, <laughs> I spend a good part of most of my working days, I spent all of them in the 18th century and a good part of many of them, you know, thinking a lot about Madison. And after 40 some years, I still, I still find thinking about Madison a very fruitful and, stimulating subject. So I'll, I'll share with you some thoughts at the end about Madison as opposed to Jefferson uh, and why, why his ideas matter and should matter to us and how we think about the founding period more generally. Um, but let me keep both of them in front of us for the moment. I'll, I'll start with an obvious comparison, uh, set up a kind of, you know, two, uh, since two kinds of triangles. Uh, so let's start first with Thomas Jefferson, the Declaration of Independence, and query 14 of the notes on the state of Virginia. Uh, anytime one uh, talks about Jefferson uh, in the context of the revolution in slavery, and indeed I think what perplexes Americans most, what troubles us most in thinking about Thomas Jefferson over the past few decades is, of course, okay, this is better? Fine. Was I okay before? Yeah. Yeah. This is better. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, there's some obvious set of questions that always arise about Jefferson, and every, we all know what the most elegant, uh, simple version of this is. How could the guy who wrote All Men Are Created Equal uh, also have been, you know, the happy slave owner of uh, Monticello uh, and the guy who indeed, you know, was spending his way towards financial oblivion? In a way, I guess it would be of some sympathy to the Pioneer Institute as, as they find out more about your, your position. Uh, you know, Jefferson is a deeply troubling character. Uh, you know, he's a visionary in so many ways, and I really believe that. Uh, he was morally opposed to slavery in certain respects, uh, but uh, at the same time, as a planter and, and home, particularly as a homeowner, uh, he was quite a wastrel. Uh, and the fate of his slaves upon his death in 1826 was essentially to be sold, and many of their families broken up and you know dispersed across the southern landscape. And of course, Jefferson was also the author of Query 14 of the Notes on the State of Virginia. I should say what that is and not rely upon your memory. So this is. Uh, you know, it was published in the early 1780s. Jefferson himself definitely saw it as an anti-slavery tract. In query 14 of the notes, he referred to his plan or a bill uh, he said he had drafted that would provide for the gradual emancipation of African-American slaves in Virginia to be followed by their colonization elsewhere. Uh, and in query 14, he asked the question, well, why should we do this? And he starts by saying uh, what I think are kind of, you know, frank and candid and... Uh, reservations. Basically, he says there's a whole set of political reasons why uh, whites and African Americans will not be able to coexist as one people in one society. And, you know, I think he lays those out. There's a kind of, you know, naked candor to what he's saying there, which is disturbing, but, you know, plausible in lots of ways. But then beyond that point, he goes on to speculate uh, in a fairly open-ended and in some ways actually badly disciplined way about uh, sources of racial difference between whites and, uh, and, and Africans. Uh, and he writes, you know, his passages to any modern reader are deeply disturbing. It, it, is, it is kind of proto-racist thought. It's the kind of thought that would become much more fashionable 
in the 19th century than it was in the 18th century, something historians have realized over the years, and that makes it all the more disturbing. It's not that Jefferson is representing uh, the wisdom of the age so much as foretelling how racial thinking was going to evolve uh, in the decades to come. So when we think about Jefferson, this is the context within which we think about him. You know, we think about his personality, we think about the authorship of the Declaration of Independence, uh, and then we triangulate that with Query 14 and a few of the other documents that Jefferson wrote on issues of race and slavery, uh, and we're left with this deeply puzzling portrait of uh, an American who in many ways represents uh, many of the most radical, and I mean in, in the you know, positive progressive sense of the term, uh, many of the most you know, challenging and you know, in some ways ennobling aspects of the American Revolution, but with this very, to put it mildly, very complicated history of relations to slavery. And of course, in recent years, that's been you know, developed further by, uh, I think, the general agreement among scholars, though there are some so-called deniers out there uh, of Jefferson's relationship with Sally Hemings and you know, the, you know, presumably the four, four to five children uh, that they produced together. So that's my first comparison. My second is, what would we do comparably for Madison? Well, here I think uh, you can make a, make a kind of um, you know, similar, similar move. So we start with Madison, Jefferson's neighbor, you know, from about 30 miles away. I'm, I'm now on the board in Montpelier, Madison's house, and was previously on the International Center for Jefferson Studies, and my son did his PhD in Charlottesville, so that's the neck of the woods where I hang out a lot uh, these days. So, you know, Madison is Jefferson's neighbor from, you know, 25 some miles away. It takes about half an hour to do the drive now. So we have Madison uh, with his great house in Montpelier with its fabulous view of the Blue Mountains, the Blue Ridge, excuse me, just as, just as nice as Jefferson's view. Um, we have the adoption of the Constitution in 1787 with all its compromises over slavery. We have the knowledge that Madison was the actual author of the three-fifths clause in its original form going back to 1783, just as a rule for apportioning expenses among the states of the Union under the Article of Confederation. And in Madison's uh, case, as opposed to, you know, let's say in juxtaposition with uh, the notes on the state of Virginia, we have Madison's 54th Federalist. I, it's an essay, I'm not sure how many of you have read or will have read recently, but it's, um, it's an essay in which Madison tries to make sense of the way in which uh, the Constitution, uh, Article 2, provides for the apportionment of both of representation and of direct taxes among the states on the basis of the three-fifths rule. Uh, three-fifths rule is something I think many Americans don't understand. It's something that has to be taught accurately. Uh, to students. Let me say something more about this in a second. Curious thing about Federalist 54, it's the only essay of the 85 essays in the Federalist uh, where, the, where Publius, you know, the collective pseudonym for Madison, Hamilton, and Jay, uh, where it's the only time when a kind of putative character is created as opposed to the author. Uh, Madison imagines what a Southern spokesman might say in behalf of the proposition, well, we should think about African-American slaves as being both people <laughs> and property. And so Madison lays out an argument, which I think had, in fact, not been made at the much, if at all, at the Constitutional Convention as to why slaves would have this dual problematic capacity that could be factored into the rule for representation, but also for taxation. He tries to make sense of this. And then at the end of the essay, he kind of comes out of quotation marks and says, well, this is what such a spokesman might say, and though I don't really agree with all of it, it's not a bad argument. I mean, I'm kind of paraphrasing here, but that's the essence of the essay. So again, in some ways, very much like Query 14. It's a very revealing, troubling uh, kind of document. It's not entirely clear, you know, how to, you know, how to, how to, you know, how to, you know, how to read the voice, how to identify the speaker in this essay. How much is Madison philosophizing? How much is a character he's creating just to get a set of <coughs> arguments out there? So I set up two sets of triangles, you know. Jefferson, the Declaration, Query 14, Madison, the Constitution, uh, Federalist 54. Um, what can we say about this comparison? Well, the first one involving Jefferson, I think, is important. Uh, for us today, uh, what matters about this is Jefferson's language lays down a set of principles which are troubling to us mostly for their contradictions. Right? Disturbances about Jefferson is the gap between espousing a theory of government resting on, you know, the notion, the right of the people uh, to be founded on premises of equality on the one hand and his private record on the other. Uh, it's, really, uh, it's really a set of principles about self-government, which Jefferson in some ways seems to deny or defy or, you know, to, to muddy. In Madison's case, it's a matter of political commitments. Not so much principles as political commitments. Madison's defending the Constitution with the two-thirds, uh, excuse me, with the three-fifths clause, uh, you know, for representation, and taxa direct taxation, 
uh, with the rule for fugitive slaves, uh, with a couple other provisions that, you know, that recognize and help to entrench slavery uh, in the American system. And again, he does so on grounds that, you know, that, that aren't wholly uh, persuasive. But what really troubles us is we know where this history is going to go. Uh, and Madison indeed foresaw where it was going to go uh, by the time of his death in 1836, which of course is two or three years, or it's just say three to four years after the nullification crisis in South Carolina. So there's kind of you know, a nice set of parallels we can set up, contradictions in principles when we worry about Jefferson, uh, thinking about the consequences, I think more specifically when we think about Madison. Now, if we were teaching this subject, and this is what I've, this is what I've tried to do with my, with my Stanford students, who I assure you were um, you know, somewhat more mature than the, you know, primarily, I guess, the high school students, but also K-12 students we're talking about, uh, who are deeply qualified. And, you know, as, I, as I like to say, I must have done something right in a past life that I've been able to spend my teaching career on the farm, because the students we get are just absolutely superb. And I was actually just discussing one of them with, the, 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 uh, with Will here, the editor of the Concord Review, who, you know, a uh, young advisee of mine, a freshman, who's already, you know, a published scholar uh, in his journal. Uh, she kind of knocks my socks off, knowing I'm going to deal with her over the next four years. It's itself already a challenge. Uh, but, uh, you know, um, so what I've always tried to teach my Stanford students when I come to this last lecture on Jefferson uh, is to try to raise the question about how do we reason morally, uh, or should we reason morally at all? Uh, about the legacy of the founding generation. So here's, here's a serious question that I think teachers at every level have to think about. Um, and here's the argument I make for my students. It's easy to pass judgment on the past. It's very easy to condemn the founding generation for failing to adequately confront or deal with problems of slavery and race relations. It's not very difficult. It's easy to condemn slave owners. It's not much of a challenge. Uh, is that what we, should, what we should do as historians? I actually think not. Judgment is easy. Explanation is hard. The real challenge, you know, is not to judge. Was, are we better or worse than the past? Uh, it's really to explain why the past acted in the way that it did. The challenge, in other words, is really to understand uh, why Jefferson could be the Jefferson he was or why Madison would make the accommodations he felt were worth making. If you want to condemn them, that's fine. It won't do you any harm. Uh, well, maybe it will do you a little harm. I'll, I'll take that back, because one of the things I want to urge my students is I don't think we should assume our moral superiority over the past. Even, perhaps even when we're dealing with an issue like slavery. That's to say, there's any of a number of other issues that we could talk about in our own contemporary world. 20th century is not the happiest period uh, in world history. There are even a number of issues in our own world, contemporary society, where if we were more honest with ourselves, we would, you know, we would probably judge ourselves more harshly than we, than we would on any given day. So one thing I want students to do is to kind of suspend the impulse to judge uh, and to think that the real challenge of thinking historically is to try to explain how people in the past acted the way they did. Judgment is easy, explanation is much more difficult. And to give one example of this, uh, you know, to make the point perfectly clear, it's very easy to say Jefferson is a hypocrite. You know, it's not a big challenge. Uh, but as I like to say, hypocrisy is not an explanation. I can't explain why somebody behaves the way he, he does simply by saying he or she is a hypocrite. It's not an explanation. Hypocrisy is a judgment about the action. It's not an explanation of its causes. So what's the real challenge of thinking historically? The real challenge of thinking historically, and I think this is true at every level, though I, you know, having been as lucky as I am to teach at, you know, one of the world's greatest universities. Uh, and I'll just suppose that even with Harvard and MIT, across the river where, where I've done time on my own as well. Uh, you know, that I, I think even there, you know, the real challenge is how do you immerse students at any level in the period you're studying and get them to try to understand what, would, what was at issue there. So any, whatever, whatever is in your book, whatever in your set of recommendations uh, for the future of high school education in Massachusetts, I think that's the challenge that always uh, awaits us. Now let me go on and say something more about Madison and Jim. I'm, I'm about 10, 15 minutes. How am I on time? About 10, that's fine, okay. So let me, you know, let me say something about Madison. Uh, and I, I can do this in fairly short order. Um, Madison started his adult life as a person with moral qualms about slavery. Uh, for a long time he resisted um, having much to do with plantation life at Montpelier, which is just south of Orange, Virginia. Uh, when, he tra when he would go north to school, uh, he traveled with a personal slave, as southerners were wont to do. 
in that period. Uh, he seems to have come away from his education, from his upbringing, with you know, real reservations about the legitimacy of slavery. But he was also a deeply prudent person. Uh, and Madison's record as an, as an outright uh, opponent of slavery is actually, in some ways, is worse, or I'll say inferior to Jefferson's. In a few of his private writings, you can see how deeply his analysis went. There's one little memorandum he writes in 1791, 1792, where he notes that in any society where slavery exists, we may claim it's a republic, but really it's going to be an aristocracy because the whole system is resting upon the domination of one class uh, over, over another class. Uh, I also think he shared with Jefferson, I think this is, this is a deeper point to be made about the two of them. Uh, I think he shared with Jefferson, and I think this is in some way is the best way to try to explain the contradictions that, you know, the tensions that trouble us today. Uh, I think he shared an inability to understand uh, how if you emancipated African Americans from slavery, how whites and blacks could live together peace, peaceably in a Republican society. When you thought about the nature of a republic, particularly in the 18th century, it's what Madison sets out to challenge, but you thought about first and foremost, people should share some common set of traits. They, you know, they should, in a sense, be one people. Uh, and I think the idea of if you emancipate Africans uh, and put them, you know, allow them to live as free citizens and, and whites, could these two peoples coexist? I think both Jefferson and Madison were deeply skeptical. Their, skepti their skepticism is not something that we should admire or warm to. Uh, but I don't think it was unrealistic. I don't think it's an implausible, it was an implausible set of assumptions. So if you want to teach this problem historically, one thing you have to try to explain is why would they have such reservations about it? And you can take a certain view of American history. You could look at the per cur current condition of the Republican Party, perhaps, as a latter-day example of this, since the whole question of how the races deal with, w deal with each other uh, still tends to challenge us today in some respects. You know, maybe that wasn't such a naive position to take. Now, so that's, you know, that's another consideration. Let me, let me finally say something about Madison and the Constitution. This will, you know, the, the kind of the most substantive payoff. So, uh, yeah, I noticed it's, noticed it's in, you know, the report from, uh, you know, from the Institute. So one of the texts that we, that's commonly taught today, at least to your better students, and we always want to emphasize, is Madison's famous essay, Federalist 10. The first essay he contributed uh, to the Federalist, published on November 26, 22nd. Uh, 1787. I'd like to ask my students why is November 22nd a significant date in American history? Uh, since I was a high school junior back in 1963, I remember well you know, my impressions uh, of that date. Um, why is this such a famous test? Well, text, yeah, well it's a famous text because Madison makes a pretty straightforward argument. Uh, the reigning wisdom in thinking about the nature of a republic said, comes from Montesquieu but also from many other sources, that uh, if you want to live in a republic where the people are self-governing, should be a relatively small, relatively homogeneous society. The people should possess a common virtue, meaning they should have the ability to kind of subordinate private interest to public good. They should all know their citizens, they're responsible, they have duties to the welfare of the, of, of the collectivity uh, that they ought to honor. This is the kind of wisdom that's associated with Montesquieu. So it says republic should be small, maybe the size of Rhode Island, which I'd like to tell my students. You know, if Rhode Island fell into the ocean, would anybody know? <laughs> which is kind of, you know, uh, Rhode Island, well known in the 18th century is the home of Jews, Turks, and infidels. I, I think that's a name that's dropped out of common usage, uh, but so on. So, but the idea is republic should be small and relatively homogeneous, and a citizen should be, you know, should share a common virtue, common set of traits. That's what Madison sets out to challenge. And what he, could, he sets out to challenge what he calls the prevailing theory. And his general argument is, look, well, um, you know, in any modern society, we can't have uniformity of interest. All modern societies are diverse, they're complex, and uh, if we look at ordinary citizens, it's nice if they do act virtuously on occasion, but they have passions, they have interests, they have opinions. They're gonna fight over you know, the kinds of economic interests they have, but they fight over the, the mere fallibility of human judgment. So if we wanna be Republicans, if we wanna, lowercase r, if we wanna believe in, in popular government, we need a different theory uh, that's gonna prevail here. The theory Madison says is, look, we have to assume people are vicious as well as virtuous. They pursue interest and opinion and passion. Uh, and it turns out that if we're worried about protecting rights, uh, which is a big concern of his, actually diversity, size and diversity, complexity, extent, will be beneficial. The larger society, the more complex it is, the more diverse it is, the more difficult it will be for the wrong kinds of majorities to form. Uh, and instead, what you'll try to get is a process of deliberation among people coming from different interests, where they're really gonna have to work out what the common public good, what the common policy 
ought to be. That's a general theory. Now, I, I have two more points to make about this, and then I'll, you know, I'll wrap up my session, go worry about what kind of season the Cubs are going to have this year. If it's as bad as last year, I think I'll just turn to basketball instead. Um, so one interesting use of this theory, when you see this very much at the Constitutional Convention, is that um, the theory, well, uh, Madison, you know, during the, Madison uses this theory when they debate the, the argument over big states and small states, you know, the rule of representation. And at one point, Madison argues in late June 1787, when the convention is moving towards deadlock on this, Madison argues, I think quite correctly, he, he uses the issue of slavery as a way to trump the debate over big states, small states. The, the, the argument from Delaware and small states, you can't say from Rhode Island, since they weren't there, but from Delaware. Uh, because they were in Philadelphia, is that our vital interest will be suppressed, will be overridden if we don't get an equal vote in at least one house of, you know, of, of, of the new Congress. Madison argues entirely correctly uh, that the small states don't really have interests as small states. You never vote on the basis of the size of the state in which you live. Don't look so surprised, it's true. You never vote on the basis of the size of the state in which you live, except when you're voting on rules of voting. But people who live in small states do not have interests different from people who live in big states. Instead, according to Madison's theory, you have to look at what are their real interests in terms of their occupations, in terms of their opinions, in terms of their passions. You know, you don't wake up in one day and say, what's good for the small states? It's just not an issue. The way he tries to explain this is to say that the real division of interest in the United States does not lie between small and large states it lies between the northern and southern states. And that difference is, uh, first off, it's a matter, it's a function of climate. This is a kind of a reference to Montesquieu, as it happens. But more directly, the presence or absence of slavery. Madison introduces the slavery question, in other words, as a way of saying, these are the real interests we need to balance over the long run. Uh, small and large state, that's gonna disappear. We're never gonna disagree again. Wh whatever we do in Philadelphia, we will not disagree again about this. <coughs> or at least we want to agree in the census, we're not going to vote on this basis, so it's not an interest that we have to adjust, that we have to kind of reconcile over the long run. It's manifesting itself now, but once the convention is done, it'll disappear. And he's essentially correct about that. Uh, slavery and freedom, those are issues we have to wrestle with if we want to have a federal union. We have to, we have to you know, and if we want to reconcile North and South, this is the issue we have to deal with directly. That's what leads you to the, three, to the three fifths clause. That's the best political explanation of the three fifths clause. You have to give the South a formula to assure them that they're going to have an adequate amount of representation uh, in the national government. You're throwing the taxation thing as a kind of guise. It's really kind of a deception to say that, well, it's not just look at rights of representation, they'll also have to pay for it. In fact, they never did on the basis of the three fifths rule. So that's fine as far as it goes. Here's the big kicker, and Madison understood this at the time, and he understood even better over the course of his life. The great problem with bringing up the question of slavery and uh, freedom as a superior way of thinking about the interests the Union had to reconcile uh, was it basically undermined Madison's whole theory of faction. That's, that, that, or let's say it's the one great exception which challenges Madison's entire theory. How does it do that? It does it in a fairly simple way. If you assume there's, uh, if it takes slavery out of the question, and you assume there is a multiplicity of interests out there. You know, there are ports and there are farms. You know, we grow tobacco here, wheat there, cotton, well, not cotton yet, rice someplace else. You know, New England you know, is actually big on fish. I ate illegal seafood again last night <laughs> over in Cambridge and so on. Uh, so New England, actually New England is associated more with fish than with anything else. Squad, whatever that is. Uh, and, and, you know, and, uh, and, and so on. So we have this diversity of interests, and it's this kind of milling around that's going to produce the right conditions for deliberation, Madison thinks. But there is one great exception to this. If, in fact, you have a single issue that divides the American people on the basis of a, sh of a sharp regional divide, then the whole theory about how faction is going to operate to save the republic over the long run, that's going to break down. Slavery and freedom will exist in a concentrated way in two different regions. And if politics ever comes to revolve around arguing over slavery, there won't be any adequate way to preserve the republic. Because now, you, don't, you won't have a multiplicity of factions. You'll have a single issue dividing the country. It will be regionally concentrated. Therefore, it becomes much easier uh, for parties to organize on a strongly factional basis in ways that will be fundamentally 
antagonist. Uh, and that would be a great lesson for teachers to teach to their students. Thanks very much.